least one day I would like to see a streaming service that offers things like, you know, me Caribbean media, our our stories, our music. On this powerful episode of Pushing Your Peace podcast, I am joined by the incredible Celine Sandhaus, an Antigua-born Afro-Caribbean cultural ambassador who truly embodies the strength in embracing one's heritage. Celine shares her journey of discovering her personal power through her Afrocentric identity and highlights how stepping fully into her roots allowed her to find her purpose in life. We also dive into the pea prosperity and discuss how prosperity is so much more than material wealth. It's about a mindset, quality of life, and seeing opportunities everywhere. This episode is filled with insights on living authentically and powerfully. Sit back, relax, and let's get ready to push some peas. Celine Sandhouse, thank you so much for being a yes. guest on Pushing Your Peas <laughs> podcast. My fellow sister from my Antigua, pleasure. pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah. Tell us, where did pleasure. your journey start with fashion? Where did your fashion journey begin? So as I would have mentioned during my introduction, I was always surrounded by elegant women, elegant, stylish women. My paternal grandmother was a seamstress. She hails from the island of Guadeloupe. She taught herself how to sew. And depending on who in Antigua you ask, I'm sure that she would be hailed as one of the best seamstresses in Antigua. She is still, she's still around, still alive. Um, she's now retired. And um, my mom was also a, a fashion model. My mom is from Grenada. Big up St. David's. <laughs> if you've ever been to Grenada, my mom is from the parish of St. David's. She was a fashion model. She was a flight attendant. Um, mm. She was also a, um, a pageant contestant back in the day when she was young. She moved to Antigua to fly with um, Yacht Airlines. She decided to stay. Um, sometime later, she then decided. She's always been not only Afrocentric, but somebody who loves fashion, quality shoes, nice clothes and the like. And so she decided to open our boutique, Footnotes Boutique, primarily selling shoes at first. She used to do primarily shoes, um, dress hats, accessories. And around the time of the pandemic, we had to segue, I would say the, which we'll, you know, we'll touch on the pandemic um, a little later on as well. But I think sometimes um, certain things can be a, a curse and a blessing as well. Or out of something negative, you can, Pivot, pivot and turn it into a positive. So we decided to segue or to diversify into into clothing. Um, one of my aunts as well was a carnival queen in the 80s, queen of carnival for Antigua. So these were the types of women that I grew up with. I always saw fashion and makeup and glitz and glamour. And you know, in Antigua we would say science or stush. I don't know what you would say in the, in the Cayman Islands, but there was a certain type of of a vibe, a stylish vibe that I grew up with as a little girl or, or over the years growing up. And and I think it's funny because I was a tomboy growing up, but somehow the stylishness and the, and the fashion, it, it rubbed off on me. What can I say? I was very tomboyish growing up. I was, I'm the oldest of, I think, five of us in our generation. My dad has um, two sisters, so it was a total of five. I was the only girl. So I did karate. I was into Pokemon and Beyblade and climbing trees and falling down and I think, and I think for a second there, my mom was a little bit like, okay, but but you're a girl, you know, you know what I mean? You're supposed to do this, you're supposed to do that. Um, while I was, I would say that I am somebody who, again, I think the word multifaceted would come to mind. So even though I was tomboyish, I definitely had a love for the art. We used to play children's carnivals. Out. So imagine me in lots of glitter and makeup. For, for children's carnival on the road. Um, I used to do ballet until I was about 21, like my early 20s. And I don't even think it was, I don't even think it was the pink aspect of it. I think I was very impressed or very intrigued with the limits to which, to which we could push the human body while still looking very graceful, very soft, very elegant. It all looked very effortless to me. So for a long, long time, I thought I was going to be a ballerina and then that didn't really work out. 
Um, so again, we have to we, we have to continually pivot and adapt and change. But I would say, yeah, I would say hopefully that we come back full circle and that answers your question. I would say from a very young age, I was surrounded by fashion and by by fashionable women. Um, I I started I would say maybe in high school or thereabouts. I started to kind of use fashion as a way to express myself. I was still a little bit tomboyish. I didn't really like dresses. You know, you have that awkward kind of teenage phase. I didn't really feel very pretty all the time. But I would use, you know, um, T-shirts and jewelry and stuff like that to express myself. And little by little, my, my sort of style started to evolve. It was a way for me to express how, how I was feeling maybe rebel um again i never really liked pink so much I, I liked some of the darker colors i went through like a little emo angsty teenage phase um if you can imagine that you probably can't tell by looking at me and i think when i moved away to um to canada and later on to france i think my style went a little bit more afrocentric because it helped me to feel closer to caribbean culture a little closer to my blackness i was also um sort of not put in touch with, but I, I met a lot of people from the different African countries when I went to university as well. I started to kind of take on a kind of Afrocentrism. Um, in addition, I don't know, again, I don't know if it was a kind of rebellion or feeling like wanting to kind of drill down or dig down into my blackness and my Caribbeanness for comfort because, again, I was far away from home. But I think that kind of, you know, all the, all the pieces of the puzzle from my Caribbean upbringing to um, kind of rebelling a little bit, to kind of taking on that sort of um, Afro-Caribbean pride once again and that, and that blackness. Um, and there was also the whole return to natural movement in like the early <laughs> 2010s-ish. I think yeah. all those pieces kind of mesh together to kind of, you know, make, make me what you, what you see sitting before, you know? <laughs> you know, Celine, um, one of the concepts I talked about in my book is the concept of power and how we have to nurture that yeah. in order to live a more fulfilled and happy yeah. life. And when I, when I talk about the concept of power, I'm not even talking about the physical component of it. I'm talking about something that, that comes from within. And hearing you talk about how fashion, yeah. especially the Afrocentric component of it, has given you power, can you, can you shed light on this power um, from your perspective of fashion, you know, because I, I know you talked about it being something that has has brought you closer to your identity. So again, tell me where you draw your power from when it comes to fashion. Absolutely. I mean, I think for me, as I would have mentioned, my somebody like my mom, for example, was always quite Afrocentric. She never, like, yes, yeah, she would have had her hair straightened at a point, you know, I guess the 80s and 90s where the, the big curlers and the near long looks and stuff like that were, were very in. But sometime after that, I would say I have, or other than the old pictures of her or, or maybe when I was a child growing up, after a certain point, I did not see my mom not wear a natural hairstyle she has had various kind of luck she has had an afro she has had her hair um she has it shaved right now for example um <laughs> from the decor into my in my house to how she wore her hair she didn't even want me to straighten my hair in high school by the way um i decided that i was i was going to big you know big girls school and i wanted my hair straightened but that's a a different story my parents i, I would say especially my having my mom as a um a role model or a beauty standard was very important for me looking back because she always made me feel that um, being black is beautiful. You know, my parents were always very encouraging. Nothing is wrong, you know, you're, you're beautiful the way you are, your nose and your hair and your body. They were always very affirming. Um, I think having grown up in, in our boutique, in and around our boutique, in and around our family business, I kind of understood from a young age without even being able to fully put it into words as yet now that i'm older i can but my mom especially both my parents but my mom especially showed me from a young age that african fa you know afro-caribbean fashion or caribbean fashion or caribbeanness is elegant and is fashionable and is beautiful and is worthy to be to be shown and 
and and sold in a in a boutique is is worthy of um is worthy is worthy full stop and so again i think i really clung to that when i when i went away furthermore i think sometimes we take certain things for granted i think that when you when you're away from your culture and all of a sudden you have to explain yourself then you kind of then you kind of realize i'll give you an example when i lived in um, canada but in france especially when i started to wear head ties and if you would have visited my my page on my personal page i wear a lot of head ties i think that it's a symbol a symbol of pride a symbol of our um of afro-caribbean culture absolutely i'll get into that whole thing it's a symbol of pride and a symbol of resistance and sort of a, a reaffirming and a taking back of who we are as afro-caribbean people um so when i was when i was living in france for example and i would have my head tied on the weekends i did a regular kind of nine to five so to speak during the week i was teaching english to to french you know young french students and then on the weekend now again to kind of feel a little bit more in touch with home I would tie my head and I would get a million questions um, about where I'm from, how did I learn French and so on. But obviously people are visual. So they would look at me and they would either think, well, obviously I'm Muslim or they would ask me which African country I'm from. And then when I started speaking, it would be, well, you know, your accent is a little strange. You're not from Guadeloupe, Martinique. How did you learn French? Where are you from? And so on. And I think this kind of, I didn't take it badly because again, I see that it is, a sort of talking point and people are curious so i didn't i didn't take it no way but then i think having had to sort of answer all these questions it made me more curious about caribbean history so or, or caribbean fashion where did it all come from because they were asking me obviously well if you're not if it's not a religious symbol or if it's not a hijab like like the muslims wear why would you want to cover your head anyway you know what i mean that was their kind of take on it so when i returned home in 20 i want to say 2017 ish yeah i came back to Antigua in about 2017 2018 or thereabouts i started wearing more head ties and people here would also ask me similar questions but <laughs> it would also it would it would be more um the the comparison i would get would be with rastafarianism well are you a rasta do you have locks how come you tie your head and so anyway my parents and so on would encourage me you know, this whole head tie thing, this is you. This is something that you wear really well and you wear proudly. And long story short, in in 2020, same year with the pandemic or thereabouts, I launched my head tie brand as a complement or as a line under our, under our boutique. And so in doing so, I started to read um, Antiguan, Antiguan books or um, books on Antiguan history. I, I made a visit to the... Um, to the museums, archives to try and find pictures. You know, did Antiguan women always tie their heads or is it something that was reserved for the Creole islands only? And so what I ended up uncovering was that, um, and yes, indeed, Antiguan women have tied their heads. I would say that one of the earliest pictures I found was 1904. And similar to, or long story short, the head tie became a visual language. So anyway, long story short i'm gonna try and keep it brief i know we only have half an hour but i would say that all in all caribbean caribbean fashion is powerful for me because it's interesting how we i think i think the world has always because of our history has always kind of counted us out or kind of seen us as less than and it's interesting to me that at every turn not even talking about things like music or food i think that fashion is extremely powerful because when we when we trace it back it, it comes from something it has a meaning the head tie came about as a response to black women being denied the wear the right to wear to wear hats at the time 1834 though slavery had been abolished fancy dress hats were only reserved for for black or for white women so instead in the way that we do we have always found a way to push forward when we're blocked or we denied something or we're made to feel less than we have always found a way to resist and to thrive and to push forward and to uplift ourselves and that's what caribbean fashion is for me um even things like our dialect i, I think of caribbean fashion in the same way it's it's um 
an invention and a, and a, and a creation and, and an innovation and a symbol of who we are, especially as Afro-Caribbean people. We still have our, when we look at the way we speak, our food, the way we dress, we still have um, elements of it that tie us back to our, to our African origins. I think for me, I feel powerful when I wear a head tie. I, w I feel powerful when I wear Afro-Caribbean or Caribbean type clothing and fashion. Even if you look at the dance hall scene, for example, I mean, I'm not Jamaican, but I have to, I have to big up the Jamaicans because Jamaicans have their own style. You can see that that is distinctly them and that's powerful for them to say, well, we don't want to dress like anybody else. This is us, this is our identity. And I think that's a reflection of them as a people. I also think that when I wear my head tie or when I see somebody in a head tie, a woman especially, men too, but I think it's a kind of rejection of, uh, you know, this, this importance that sometimes the Western world or the, the Eurocentric standards of beauty put on um, a woman's hair. When I, when I wear my head tie, you have no idea what's going on under there. You don't know if I have hair or not, but I still feel very in touch with my roots. I know who I am. I'm, I'm proud to be from the Caribbean. I'm proud to be black. I'm proud to be from Antigua. And I think you sort of get, even if you don't get all those messages at once, you get that sense when you For look sure. at me. Or you get that sense when you see somebody in a head tie, when you see somebody in a, in a pattern dress. I'm also very proud to say that as part of our our um our offering at footnotes boutique we offer locally made clothing caribbean made clothing and an african made clothing as well because again we want to show that yes we are good enough yes there are local tailors and seamstresses and and creators that are worthy to be sold or worthy to be offered in a boutique yes there are amazing caribbean designers that are on the same level as, as other international brands that you could call, if not better. Yes, they absolutely are worthy. Yes, we are capable. And I think same thing with, with um, these are from these are from Kenya, if I'm not mistaken. But yes, there are there are artisans that, that look like you and I that are that are skilled. It's just about finding them and supporting them and highlighting them and again offering offering them to a to a wider audience. I think for me that's what's powerful about about fashion. Yes, people are visual, but it's beyond that. I think it's about what we what we support. I think I think we I think that's a kind of power in itself. Are we gonna continue to only support the the sort of Western or North American or European brands? What what are we saying? Or or whom to whom are we giving our support, monetary or otherwise? What what are we setting as as the standard, I think I think we absolutely have the power to to change that. I think I think when it comes to power and fashion, it's not just about it's not just about clothing. I think who and what we support and who and what we deem to be beautiful and worthy and valuable. I think I think that's where the power that's where the power lies. Thank you so much for sharing that, Celine. And you am the Turks and Caicos Islands. I know you would have yes. said came in earlier, but I'm really from Turks and Caicos. Oh, right? I'm so sorry. <laughs> My That's apologies. Fine. <laughs> but I, I wanted to say this. That's fine. Don't worry about it. I wanted to say because we're, we're we're actually identical. You know, the British Union Jack in the corner right there. I mean, yeah. That's you know. what I thought. The flag. <laughs> I the flag. I'm so sorry. That's on me. My That's geography possible. teacher and my history teachers would be very disappointed in me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I, 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 say, I, I wanted to mention that because we are a British overseas territory, right? But in the Turks and Caicos Islands, we are becoming heavily Americanized simply because we're only a one hour and 20 minute flight away from the U.S. So we're very close to the United States and our culture is heavily influenced by America. How do we be intentional Based on what you've gone through in Antigua and how loud you are about your identity, how can you, how can we now in the Turks and Caicos Islands um, be intentional about um, the power of our culture or, or the retention of our culture and miss this whole Americanization of uh, our, our culture that's happening right now? Hmm. That's a bit of a tough one, but again, I think it goes back to what we highlight, what we celebrate, 
um, what we put emphasis on. I'm not, I'm never going to say that um, we cannot, or let me put it another way. We can't eliminate American culture entirely, American culture or pop culture or whatever you would like to call it. I would say is one is one of the leading ones from from ever since when it comes to movies and music and you know just just basic basic trends i would say probably not only because the sheer size of their population but their media and so on as well i would say a way to kind of counteract that is again the telling and the highlighting of our own stories and i think putting value on the things that we create i would even go as far as to say perhaps having our own you know besides besides channels like tempo i would see i would like to see more of that very much for us by us when it comes to um when it comes to fashion when it comes to music when it comes all the things that we consume all the things that we consider to be to be fun and and trendy and powerful i think i think it really starts with us again is the question of okay how are we how are we spending our money even things like streaming services. One day, I would like to see a streaming service that offers things like, you know, Caribbean media, our our stories, our music. Um, I also I also want to ask the question, for example, when it comes to things like not ease of movement so much, but in a sense, yes, when it comes to things like shipping, I might want to let's say I want to buy that shirt that you have on, and maybe it comes from a boutique in Turks and Caicos. How I, I might, I might have the, the wish to support the designer, but how easy is it for me to a pay for it online, and how easy is it for me to to get it from Turks to me so that I can wear it on my person and say, you know, I'm supporting this awesome designer from Turks and Caicos or what have you. I I think it it has to do with just the overall structure. I think the the overall structure of things to to get it from. From you to me. I also think, again, if we have these platforms online and otherwise, maybe a Spotify or other streaming services that make it easier for Caribbean people to support other Caribbean people and for the art and for Caribbean artists to, to be paid and to, to push themselves further, travel, do concerts. I think our culture can only can only grow from there. But it sometimes yeah. sometimes it can be a little difficult for us to to support each other and I, I hope that that will I hope that that will change. I think there are like-minded people out there. I think that we are um, the the awareness is increasing that we do need to to support the things that we want to see. Um, but you know, there's always there's always room for improvement. I hope that it will it will become easier for us to to support each other, highlight each other, celebrate each other. I think that's how we will kind of um increase that 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 caribbean pride and kind of reinforce not kind of i think that's how we will reinforce that caribbean pride feeling or helping helping each other or even the upcoming generations to feel proud to feel proud to be caribbean and you know that's why i love upa soka um, this is my second year being a part of the upa soka cruise and it was just a melting pot of all of us appreciating our cultures. Um, everybody was dressed in their colors. It was so beautiful. When you when you take I a snapshot that. of the picture, you see all these different flags. Um, there's like 40 different countries on this one boat, and all of us are loud. But there, there's, no, there's, there's no disrespect. Like, we're all respectful, we're all laughing and jovial. I'm like, yo, this is it. This is, this is what unity looks like. I mean, obviously we're drinking and partying, but this is, this is unity. This is what it looks like. This is, it was so beautiful. And you know what, I think that also, that also is powerful. I think that unity, I think that our generation, hopefully the generations that come after us, I think there is this kind of increased curiosity and appreciation for, for the islands of the Caribbean in general. I figure that back in the day, and maybe still some Caribbean islanders don't, they don't want to travel, they figure, well, why do I need to leave the island? Or what does what does Turks have really have? Or what does Jamaica or Trinidad or Barbados or Grenada really have? Or when they travel, and they think of 
a holiday and exploring a new culture or exploring a new place, they might want to go to Canada or England. You know, they have that soca song. I think it came from, it came from St. Vincent, where it goes, everybody dreams to go England, my dream to go back way. I really, yeah. really like that song because, again, I think it's about turning this idea of prosperity and where should we go in our free time or or where is a where is a how to say a bucket list kind of destination i think it's about turning it on its head and trying to remind people that okay where we live is paradise too and we should appreciate it i think that traveling to the different carnivals or doing an uber soca cruise like you said i i love i mean i can't say um how to say i i haven't put a dent in my carnival travel bucket list as yet but little by little i'm working on it i think that's also a way for us to connect to discover different carnival traditions because again they're tied to our history from back in the day our mass traditions don't come from nothing i think it's important for us to understand the mass traditions the music traditions and so on from each of our islands i think it helps to it helps us to appreciate our similarities and our differences and helps us to just have a more enriching kind of perspective as as caribbean people i absolutely think that like you said i'm imagining just all the different flags not only the party and so on but just the appreciation and the caribbean yes. pride and i i love that yes. i think that there is i think that there is power in that absolutely that caribbean yes. unity i think is powerful absolutely absolutely celine thank you so much you <laughs> shared so much job so many jobs i want to thank you uh for My doing pleasure. That. Now we're going to transition into the sacking half of the show where you push your P's or your P. So any word that begins with a lot of P, you now have an opportunity to talk about it um, and talk about its influence in your life and how it has been transformational to your journey. You now have the floor. All right. Well, the word that comes to mind is prosperity. And I think that when I was little or when I was much younger coming up, I would have thought of prosperity as only money or material things, you know, a nice house, a nice car, you know, that, that image that we see, yes, on American media with the, the, the one white story or two fence. story house with the white picket fence and the dog or what have you, or maybe it's being able to travel or having nice clothes and so on. But I think as I've grown older, my idea of prosperity has changed. Yes, we want financial stability, but I think prosperity can also take other forms do i have do i have quality of life for example do i have um um i would say mental physical and emotional well-being i might have money quote unquote i I might have money in the bank but am i happy or with that money or lack thereof can i still create for myself the life that i want i think that that's that that's an idea or, or a form of prosperity. Do I feel fulfilled? I might be doing a, a good job where I'm getting money and I have a lot of perks, but do I feel fulfilled? Do I feel like I am fulfilling my purpose in this world or in my society, in my family, in my community, in my country? I think, I think that is an answer to the question of, do you feel like you're prosperous or not? Do you have a prosperity mindset perhaps? Can you see a problem and turn it into into an opportunity kind of i'm going to touch on for example the um the example of the pandemic that i gave earlier in back in 2020 when there was a lot of panic and the borders were closed and the supermarket shelves were empty and the lines were long and stuff there was this initial kind of fear where people were saying okay if the imports stop and because the borders were closed they did for a while if the imports stop how are we going to feed ourselves? Where are we going to get food from? I don't know about Turks, but in Antigua, Antigua and Barbuda is one of the drier islands. We're sometimes stricken with drought, for example. So sometimes agriculture and so on can be a little difficult. But I remember that after a time, um, an idea pushed by the government was the idea of backyard farming. So people got really excited about their backyard farms. And then lo and behold, um, you know, certain people would have taken the, um, the vaccine, the borders reopened, we were taken off of certain lists, and tourism and travel and stuff um, was, um, how to say, restored in a sense, and then people kind of forgot that idea of, okay, where is our food going to come from? However, right. I think that that was a bit of a lost opportunity 
for Antigua and Barbuda and for and perhaps for other countries of, of the region to really come together and answer this question of of food. Because for me, me personally, is a country prosperous if it can't feed itself? If it's unsure of, yeah. um, let's say, God forbid, God forbid that's another kind of crisis like that were to happen. It's not when you're in the midst of a crisis that you that you think of questions like that. So when it comes to, for me, prosperity equates to food security. That's a, that's a big one for me. Prosperity for me also equates to the education of the population. I am elated that Antigua, Antigua now has the UE5 Islands campus. I'm very excited that we now have another tertiary level ed, um, education institution on the island. I'm thinking of, I think there were, um, graduations recently i think last week or the week before for for ue5 islands campus and i'm very excited to see what these graduates will will become we'll put back into the society we'll put back into the jobs that they're going to do are they going to become managers are they going to become leaders I'm, I'm excited to see what positive you know it can only be positive i imagine obviously what right. effect or what what sort of development in the way of prosperity yes in the way of prosperity that um having this tertiary level institution on the island will have for development both at a local level at a regional level and on the world stage as well i think education absolutely is a key to um sorry to prosperity um yeah, yeah i think i think for me in answer to your question prosperity is so much more than just um than just than just money than just financial stability i think i think it's it's um it's all encompassing it, it's mindset and can we find joy can we find moments of happiness it's not just it's not just about money so i want us to going forward to to think about prosperity and to think about what it what it really means to us and obviously you can't get nothing you can't get nothing for nothing yes we have to work hard but we do have to <laughs> have Indeed. moments where we we take time to enjoy as well that's why i love your your uber so soca cruise example because i imagine you work very hard but i love to see that you that you go and jam and and have fun and, and make all of that make memories and make all of that worthwhile remind yourself that life is worth living that there's joy and there's fun to be had i i love that i think that's also a, a part of the prosperity mindset you know, I love so much about how you described it is that it's personal. Like, we don't have to subscribe to society's definition of it. You can personalize it and make it your own. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Celine, so you have been fantastic. Timothy, you were right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, you wouldn't be a guest on my show if I didn't close off with a spin-off question. So are you ready? Oh, yes. If you were seasoned, now there's four seasons. If you were seasoned, what season would you be? Ooh, that's a hard one, but I would say summer. A lot of good things happen in summer. Explain. Summer. Summer is beach. Summer is fetting. I think maybe <laughs> even, I mean, it's a little different now that we're adults. Summertime when you're a child is like a magical almost never ending you know the show phineas and ferb where it's like <laughs> summer vacation is this endless it's thing i it's feel it's like it. as that's the kind of the image of it that i had as a child we would at least take one trip either to my mom's native grenada or, or to someplace else um it's beach with my cousins might have been like summer camp you know the day camps that they would have you know that your parents would take you to mm -hmm. it's um barbecues in antigua it means carnival our carnival is syn synonymous with emancipation day so the first monday and tuesday in august so again it was um children's carnival it was beach it was travel it was sleeping in late it was playing with my cousins so i have a lot of good memories as a child of summer but then I think too, even as an adult, you kind of get a kind of, you get a kind of excitement when you know that summer is coming. It might be not only fetting and carnival, but it might just be, I, th I think it's, I think it's fun. I think it's that middle of the year part in the Caribbean anyway. Um, it's that middle of the year where even though you still have to work, there are a lot of things that you can look forward to. Again, whether it's travel or people coming to visit or carnival, there's a special kind of excitement. I mean, the heat is you know, separate and apart. Um, but I think there's a special kind of excitement that comes with summertime. 
So I think I would be Summer. And you know, some of our best memories, our childhood memories happened during the summer Absolutely. too. Exactly, Indeed. exactly. Celine, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on Pushing Our Peace. Do you have Definitely. any final words to our audience? Um, I would say remember that, remember that you're powerful. Don't underestimate your power. I think that not only is the, the money in your pocket powerful, but your voice is powerful. What you choose to support, what you choose to highlight, what you choose to use your voice to to celebrate and to um yeah what, what you choose you what you use your voice to to highlight that's powerful and i would say don't don't underestimate don't underestimate that thank you so much celine ladies and gentlemen celine sandhouse make sure you guys follow her on all the social media handles that she's about to mention she's also about Please to talk a business. I'll give you the floor one more time, Celine. Please plug yes. in yourself. Where can we find okay. you? So all the plugs. Our family-owned boutique here in Antigua is Footnotes, all one word, like the footnotes at the bottom of a page, both an S. Footnotes underscore Antigua. That's our Instagram. You can also find us. It's just Footnotes. You'll see my. You'll see my face. I model some of the pieces, so you'll see me. I'm at. We're easy to find. Just look for me. Um, my head tie page is Chant Fleur. It's also tagged on the footnotes page, so don't worry too, too much about the spelling. And my personal page is The Fenty Horse. Fenty like Rihanna, horse like the animal, all one word. You can find me on Instagram, that's where I'm most active. But you can also find me on Facebook, Celine, all E's, no I, C E L E N E, Senhouse, S E N H O U S E. You can find me on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, Celine Sandhouse, it has been a pleasure, and I hope to have you back on Pushing Your Peace in the near future. Just, say, just say when, Leo. Just say when. <laughs> Thank you guys, and I'll see you guys next week on Pushing Your Peace Podcast.